So now we have uh, Tim Potty, who wears very many, many hats in the food world and the wine world. Thank you, sorry, the wine world today. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Um, I'm probably the odd man out here because I'm more of a uh, food guy, and um, I come to I come to wine through the back door a little bit. So I'm not going to pretend to uh, know even a couple of ounces of knowledge that these guys have displayed, but I I respect their opinions, and uh, I've known them for years. I love them as peers, and they're so welcoming and accommodating to me, and uh, I'm just so lucky because I. I came to BC, most people learn about wine um, in a very formal, structured manner. I don't have that background. I, um, I sort of jumped on the BC bandwagon uh, because it was there, because I was told to. I, I was writing about food and the restaurant reviews with Furia and uh, Richard Harris, who uh, is now a partner in uh, Authentic Wines, at that point ran British Consultants. He said, you know, Tim, you really can't write about food unless you write about wine. And I said, well, I, I can't do that. It terrifies the crap out of me. Uh, he said, no, no, don't worry about it. Just come, just come with me to, my, to this tasting next week. He'll love it. It was um, uh, Michael Mondavi at the Four Seasons. <laughs> Sid was there and uh, proceeded to rattle off, I think, you know, every vintage for the past 20 years. And I was even more intimidated. But that's beside the point. Um, you know, when I, when I thought about what I should talk about tonight, um, I tried to anticipate, I knew a little bit about what some people were doing, and I, I realized that there would be a fairly broad spectrum of issues and topics covered. And I'm a bit of a history buff, and I'm sorry, I'm writing a part, so I have notes. Um, but one thing that consumes me still to this day is the, the absolute rapidity and speed with which the Okanagan has taken hold. And, you know, again, coming to this from the food side of things, um, I just, it just really, really intrigues me the impact that the Okanagan Valley, and to be fair, Vancouver Island, and now the other growing regions that are coming on, the impact that they have on Vancouver. And it, it somewhat concerns me that we take it for granted. and. What really, really, I think it's a pity to just to do that. So my, my talk tonight is very much about the impact um, that the Okanagan has had on the Vancouver food scene. When I first came to Vancouver, um, I was appalled. Um, I was raised in a fairly civilized drinking society in the UK. And uh, the first place, I think, like most people I went for a beer, was the Sylvia Hotel, where you couldn't you were not allowed to be seen drinking from the street, so there were like these model glass uh, windows. So you sat there in English Bay, that gorgeous view was right, right there, and you couldn't look out. Um, so that was my introduction, and then shortly after that, um, I experienced uh, Expo 86, where one of the big issues that came up was the unicorn wanted to um, serve real draft Guinness, not the crap that was being made by the bats on the license, and it was a huge big deal, and they eventually had to pass an order in council or something of that nature in, in, at the cabinet level to allow the unicorn to bring in Guinness. So that, what I'm, the reason I'm telling you that is because I think that um, it really puts it into perspective. You know, that was 86, okay, it's a long time ago for some of you, but for me it's just like yesterday. Um, and that, that is all really prior to the um, to the genesis, if you want, as to when the Okanagan was really beginning to have, a, have an impact. So, drinking outside the box, why Vancouver is forever in the Okanagan's debt. And I, you know, I, I made that, I hope, a little bit provocative, because I think we should, again, take it for granted. We used to be a city, for the most part, of swillers, of cheap plonk, Interspersed with a few people like Sid and David, and obviously Michaela and Michelle, um, who actually had a decent palate and a good salad to go along with it. And I'm sure there are some people here that might be tempted to suggest we still drink um, way too much cheap wine. But things have changed so much, and I think that, you know, the emergence of the Okanagan, sorry. 
has just had a huge impact on what we're doing now um, as a food town. But I want to focus on a couple of things. Um, Vancouver's food and wine culture in the mid, up until about the mid-90s was revolving around a really small circle, especially, especially in the area of wine. If you, if you went out uh, for a serious meal, you probably went to one of a handful of very specific European-oriented restaurants, uh, maybe the Wayne Tell or Il Giardino, and they had fantastic cellars to match. And then if you were going to go out for something more casual, you went to um, a more laid-back joint, and you probably drank something with a heck of a lot of oak in it, and it had been on the label, um, and you you were told that uh, you, you enjoyed you were to enjoy it because that's how Chardonnay tasted. And you know, that's pretty well where it was at in the late 80s, early 90s. So, and maybe in terms of regional cuisine, you thought regional cuisine, you walked down the street to Mr. Mike's and had a steak because it was close by, and you know, it wasn't the whole house going down. Or maybe you went to Pajos with salmon. And then and people would laugh at the very suggestion that there was such a thing as Canadian cuisine. And they'd laugh even louder if you, at the mention of Canadian wine, it was something one just didn't say in, in polite company. So what changed? Um, mainly GATT came along and free trade, and they had a huge impact without getting too involved. They, they triggered a whole series of events um, that initiated a pull-out pull program where most of the wineries, most of the wineries, not all of them, pulled out all their old hybrids, and they planted vinifera grapes, which is what the rest of the world was doing. So at that point, the Okanagan really decided to set its sights, um, I should say a few people who were really quite visionary set their sights on what could be. And the, the big guys got quite nervous. Uh, they were rightly concerned that getting rid of duties on California imports would just about eliminate their very lucrative junk wine business, which was based mainly on concord grapes, hybrid grapes. And uh, even if it didn't quite Eliminated, it did force them to look beyond the the hybrid sort of crap they're making to lesser than ever crap they're not making, and they still managed to pop off onto a an unsuspecting public under the title, the dubious and misleading title of Salad in Canada Wines. But there are a few very, very gutsy people in the Okanagan um, who we, we all know very well now, such as the Garingers, the Heises, the Heinleys, and of course Harry McWatters. And these people have already made, they made the switch. They realized that the future, if, if, if the Okanagan was to be a serious contender, it lay very much in, in growing Benefra and, and growing Benefra properly. And based on some trials, they got involved with Geisenheim University. Um, they went ahead and started to plant um, what most people thought was totally stupid at the time because that wasn't how you made money in the wine business in Canada. You made money in the wine business in Canada by growing volume and making pretty average wine. Um, so it, it, it was pretty visionary to do that. And very few people in Vancouver took them seriously. After all, people again had just tasted way too much really bad Canadian wine to take any Canadian wine here seriously. And uh, even the people who were using real grapes. And as for putting BC wines in a wine list, well, that would have been tantamount to restaurant suicide. And so, fast forward to around about mm, 1990, I think, and uh, a really gutsy lady named Janice Lotskar opened the Rangey restaurant. And a lot of people thought she was absolutely stark raving bonkers. They really did. I mean, this is not that long ago. Not only did she call it the rain tree, go figure, we have to, it's, it's wet and night, we know that. But she also, when she had these huge menus with great long listings of where the food came from, like, are you serious? I mean, people are absolutely stupid. Like, why would you bother putting where your food came from? And, and they were very, very hard on this, seriously. They did not, people didn't think it was in any way appropriate. And to compound the matter, to make matters absolutely worse, she had an all BC wine list, which again people thought was absolutely stupid. Like, why would anybody support a restaurant that had only BC wines on its list? Well, 
we can look back and we can thank Janice and she really, really started something. It took a while to get hold, but um, the rain tree really was absolutely a milestone as far as Vancouver Dining was concerned. It, it took a while, but it did spawn some really solid imitators. And, uh, but what it did more than that, and for me personally, it was quite fascinating because I was getting my feet wet. I'd been to two Mount Derby tastings by now, and I'd heard Sid talk about four or five times. I wasn't quite so intimidated. And um, the Rain Tree started to host these winemakers' dinners. Winemakers' dinners. Um, they invited people like Howard Soon and Harry Waters to come to Vancouver and to help and to pour their wines and basically start talking about wines. And that, you know, we take that for granted today, but you know, for most of the average person, even today, the, the, the people who read my column, aside from me and some of you guys, you know, I, I get a pretty good feedback as to where, the, as where, where they're thinking, and it's still a big deal to be able to sit down with a winemaker and have a discussion at their level as to what, what goes into making a bottle of wine or what goes into developing a certain wine style. So I think that uh, that was pretty radical. And I can't think of two more effective pitchmen than, than Howard Soon and Aaron Waters, who, who actually did an amazing job of getting Vancouverites turned on to the idea of having wine with food. What they had to say was uncomplicated and it was fueled by real passion that's hard to resist and it wasn't still there. It gave, I think it gave the Okanagan a tremendous edge in its battle to get accepted and established before, beside other more recognized and if you want valid wine regions. Remember this is Canada where we rarely believe anything's worth having until the States or Europe had to it to be so. And then there was a winery by the name of Blue Mountain who made a Pinot Noir that just knocked everybody's socks off in uh, the vintage, 1990 was the vintage, and uh, all of a sudden, all those really miserable people who said, I drink Burgundy, um, had to sit up and take notice that actually, you know, here was something that they could no longer ignore, that there was something actually making a credible, very drinkable wine, and um, they also made pretty decent sparkling wine to go along with that, and also Harry McWallis was doing his thing, and all of a sudden the uh, the race seemed to be on, or or was it? It's still very early days, it's still, you know, actually just 20 years ago. So again, um, back to the issue of food and wine pairing. Um, it, it, a couple of decades ago, it just wasn't happening. And uh, I remember being involved with Chris Galletta and the, when she was running the BC Wine Institute, and I think I know Sid was doing it, and I'm sure that David was there in the background somewhere. And Chris, um, in those days, BC, the Chardonnay um, consultants hadn't gotten to everybody, so the, the, the most widely planted white grape at the time was Pinot Blanc. So the very first promotion that uh, BC Wine Institute did on a, on a grand scale was, was creatively called Salmon and Pinot Blanc, a marriage made in BC. And uh, which was an interesting idea, but um, at, at the ground level, what was fascinating was that uh, several restaurants got involved and it was quite radical because they actually had menus with food and wine pairings on the menu. This is absolutely, I mean, I couldn't name it. Um, so it kick-started the whole idea that you, could, you would actually think about what wine you would have with your meal. And um, from that point, uh, the Marriage Made BC program expanded, and uh, you know, there was quite a resistance to wines by the glass, because all these restaurants would offer wines by the glass. And at the time, Ordering wine by the glass was considered to be kind of a bit, you know, um, déclassé. Uh, anybody, you know, if, if you're ordering by the glass, was it because you couldn't afford a bottle? All this kind of second rate. Um, it, it was regarded as a bit of a poor person's option. And um, but what was interesting with the whole marriage made BC program is it really got the consumer and the chefs, especially the chefs, thinking about. How they were, what food they were putting their wine with, and people started to make those connections. So all of a sudden, you had um, this introduction of Okanagan wines at a serious level, and people began to experience wines um, that were 
in many cases more fruitful, less clumsily oaked, and much brighter in acidity than the wines that they had been told they should appreciate. Um, the major market wines have been pushed at them. So beyond, you know, beyond the, the first um, effort with Pinot Blanc, um, Marriage Made in the expanded to incorporate um, Pinot Noir. And guess what? Pinot Noir goes really, really well with the rich, the rich, dense flesh of salmon. It cuts it nicely. Um, it looks pretty in the glass on the plate too. So all of a sudden, you had chefs thinking, oh, okay, we don't have to do just you know, that golden rule of white wine and fish, there are other, are other ways to do it. And again, I think it's important that, you know, that came from the Okanagan and uh, it's one, it, it's all part of the process that started getting chefs thinking much more outside of the box and being much more creative. It really, really started to fuel the, um, the food and wine revolution that we're now really, you know, reaping the benefits of. So, um, aside from visionaries, um, such as John Bishop and Janice Lobstacks, I should mention John, who was very much at Hawaiian. There was a real sort of um, cavalcade of chefs who were starting to get the idea that people actually really were interested in what, what they should drink, uh, what they should eat with their wine. And um, what, what's intriguing, we've talked about some pretty interesting wines here, you know, Sid mentions Cap Franc, and I was going to say that one of the most exciting wines I've just tasted is the, um, is the the Cab Franc from Canloops, um, from Leanne. Harvest Trail. Harvest Trail, thank you. Um, you know, and it's, to me it's quite staggering because, you know, five or six years ago to think about having a, a decent red wine from Canloops, it, it just wasn't even on the radar. And I think I'm saying, I mentioned that because that's the kind of attitude that we had before in terms of, you know, could, could the South Okanagan really do a red wine other than Chancellor? So you know, you just you can never discount what can happen when people have the right terroir and the right knowledge and, and the and the capital to make it all happen. Um, so I was going to say, what's interesting to me is um, again going back. One of the groundbreaking wines that that I I think it slipped a bit recently, but at the time it really was quite remarkable. What happened with this wine was was Sumac Ridge's uh, Gewurz because Sumac Ridge Gewurz. I think Harry McWall has figured out, as a stroke of genius, that there was this, a whole community of so-called ethnic eateries who were being ignored, you know, basically, as far as um, you know, what was available. You generally smuggled a bottle of wine, at least I did, and you were up to our two, if you were going out to them. Um, maybe, at the best, they had no wine at all, or at the worst, they had, you know, a um, couple of bottles of Cressman stuck behind the counter that were just rotting nicely, um, or you just stuck with the Crown Royal that the, the chef poured in your tea bowl and uh, got on with it. And then all of a sudden people discovered that you could indeed drink wine with spice and with pad thai and uh, especially a well-made wine like a Kuberts, which Sumex still was in those days. And again, consumers really warmed to that lovely, off-dry, slightly spicy, fruity, very approachable style, which they had been sort of been told wasn't a good thing in the past. And they were allowed to start to experience that with food. And they saw the relationship with food and they enjoyed it. So, um, how's my time? Five? Three? Less? Okay. Um, anyway, I, I just, I'm just uh, telling all this stuff because I think it's important to, uh, to keep things in perspective. Um, Again, uh, other things I think the Okanagan has brought forward. We wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here, sitting here, if it wasn't for um, obviously Fresh Tap. And I think it's been a huge opportunity that has come out of the Okanagan. Again, it's been very, very visionary. Um, it's calling like wildfire. It's great. These guys are going to show those guys down east how it works now. Um, and again, that you know, it's it's that unfettered, accepting, very forward thinking that comes out of the Okanagan, where it's not hampered in the way that it is in, in many other regions around the world, 
well, that's just not done, we shouldn't do that. Let's get on with it. It has huge implications environmentally, so I think that's another really great thing we've seen. Um, you know, even screw caps. Um, the, the key, it's, it's 13 years since the, the Kiwis came from Marlborough and showed us screw caps and showed us the difference, and that's brilliant. But at, at the same time, it was people like Sandra Oldfield and Tim Horn who said, yeah, we can do this, let's go whole hog. Lots of agents said, you can't do that, people want crocs. Sandra said, I don't want a damn croc. I don't care if it's romantic, I want the wine to taste right. And she got on with it. So again, um, that really fueled the transition away from using corks in restaurants and it plays into our whole culture and the way that we have much more relaxed dining scene today and we, I think, look at what's in, in the glass and on the plate. And my time, I think, is up. Thank you.